Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I welcome you to our silver episode of this uh, HRM webinar series. Can you believe this is uh, the 25th webinar in this International Human Resource Management Series? Uh, by the way, my name is Miguel Olivas Luján, and I am a professor in the newly established Department of Business, Economics, and Communication at, Pen at Pennsylvania Western University's College of Science, Technology, and Business. Well, today we have a special uh, treat uh, for all of us. Uh, Stacy Fitzsimmons, Mustafa Osbilgin, and Stella Como will share with us the results of their conditionally accepted GIPS article. I have a few announcements before I pass the uh, uh, virtual podium to Stacy. First of all, I want to highlight that uh, this IHRM webinar series began in 2020 when the pandemic forced us all to stay home from uh, and suspend uh, conferences and many other scholarly activities. Uh, my colleagues, Mila Lazarova from uh, Simon Fraser University in Canada, Elaine Farndale from Penn State here in the United States, Marion Festing and Maral Muradbekova from ESCP in Europe, Maya Vidovich from RIT Croatia, who is also in Europe, and I started this webinar series inviting colleagues whose recent publications or conference presentations are influencing our field. We have been taking turns at different roles in the process of co-organizing this series, but uh, special credit is due to Simon Fraser University in Canada, uh, Mila Lazarova and the team that includes Gerardo Arteaga, uh, as well as to Penn State in the United States, Elaine Farndale and Cara Adrian. Um, without uh, their resourceful centers and support, this series would have been way more difficult to organize. Uh, and not as professional for sure. <laughs> so the last very practical announcement I will offer today is that we will be using the webinars Q&A window uh, to send questions, comments, suggestions, or reactions to Stacy, Stella, and Mustafa. Please use it at any time during Stacy's presentation. At the end, we will do our best to address as many of them as we can within the 50 some minutes that we have reserved uh, for this uh, webinar um, you know, a little bit uh, less than an hour. So uh, Stacy is an Associate Professor of International Business at uh, University of Victoria's Peter B. Gustafson's uh, School of Business. Uh, she's currently visiting the University of Auckland in New Zealand. So thank you for being uh, with us uh, at such odd time in your workday. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, her work uh, deals with supporting globally mobile employees, such as immigrants, refugees, uh, and other multicultural individuals. Stacy's research has appeared in some of the most rigorous uh, journals in our field and has received awards from AOM, the Academy of Management, as well as uh, AIB, the Academy of International Business. In a, in a little bit of time, she will introduce Mustafa and Stella. Stacy, once again, thank you so much for being with us. We have been looking forward to this webinar for weeks already, so take it away. Thanks so much, Miguel, for the warm introduction, and I'm thrilled to be part of this webinar series. Um, it's really exciting what you guys are developing for everyone. Uh, so first of all, I want to introduce my two co-authors on this paper. And by the way, the, the fourth co-author, uh, David Thomas, wasn't able to join us today. Uh, so Mustafa Uzbilgin, so he's a professor of organizational behavior at Brunel Business School in the UK, and his focus is on workplace equality, diversity, and inclusion from a comparative and relational perspective. Now, I there is no way that I could list even a sample of his uh, publications or books because he has authored over 20 books, over 200 papers. He currently serves on over 20 editorial boards. He's been the editor in chief of multiple journals, including Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Journal, European Management Review, the British Journal of Management, and he, he founded the EDI conference in 2008 and has been involved in running it ever since. So I'm thrilled that he joined us on this paper because his expertise in EDI has been absolutely instrumental to the what we've done in this project. Uh, and as well, we have here Stella and Como. So Stella is, uh, it's been one of the, the highlights of my career just to get to know Stella and getting to work with her. I'm, I'm really, really, I just wanted to, to make that clear that she's been phenomenal through this whole process. She's a professor on, in the Department of HRM at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Uh, her current research focuses on diversity practices in Africa, including the relationship between diversity ideologies and practices. 
Uh, some of her many, many long list of recognitions includes that she's listed in the International Who's Who in Management Sciences. She's listed in the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. She won the Sage Scholarly Contributions Award. And some of her roles have included she was the past president of the African Academy of Management. She was elected to the Academy of Science of South Africa. And she was also at one point a scholar in residence at Harvard's Bunting Institute. One of the things she did in 2021 is she republished an updated version of her highly acclaimed book published by Harvard Business School Press called Our Separate Ways, Black and White Women and the Struggle for Professional Identity. So as a team, um, something I want to share uh, for those of you attending is that we had two people from more traditional international business background. That was me and Dave Thomas. And then we had two people who came from more mainstream EDI background. That was Mustafa and Stella. And it's been a fantastic composition of our team to look at this research through these two different lenses. And we saw very different things as I'm going to share with you today. So Stella and Mustafa are here. They are going to be in the um, helping with the Q&A and, and possibly in the chat as well. So for those of you attending live, then you can talk with them then. And then also there will be time at the end for Q&A. Before I get into the meat of the topic today, I want to recognize that I've been on these two different Indigenous lands while I've been working on this paper. It's been a many years process. At my home institution at University of Victoria, it stands on the land of the Lekwungen people. Um, that includes the Songhees, the Squimald, and Wasanich people, whose lands are um, under the University of Victoria. And then here in uh, Auckland, I've been really thankful to be welcomed by the Maori people here. And up on the screen is a Maori prayer that is sometimes used to open meetings here at University of Auckland in a good way. So thanks, thanks to these Indigenous people for welcoming me in both places. The topic of equality, diversity, and inclusion in international business specifically is something that as a team has interested us for a while. And we've actually have two, two projects going on simultaneously. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you the results of this review article, which is conditionally accepted now at JIBS. Um, but at the same time, we also have a special issue that will be coming out in the Journal of World Business sometime hopefully in 2024. We're about halfway through the process now. And I'm thrilled to report that we had a lot of interest in this special issue. We had around 60 manuscripts submitted, which is, I've heard, the second highest in this board of the Journal of World Business. So there's a lot of interest in this topic. Out of those, we sent 33 out for review. And now we're maybe at the process of about half of those still in the, in the process of being reviewed. So stay tuned. I'm curious to see how we're going to be moving the field forward if for those of you researching this field. We became interested in this topic of examining EDI specifically in the international business context because the moral landscape for EDI is changing rapidly and it affects international organizations like multinationals differently than it affects domestic firms. So for example, there's two pictures up on the screen here that demonstrate what's different about EDI in the international context. The bathroom picture is one that some of you might remember this from 2012. There was a global outrage at Ikea. Uh, the picture with the mom and the son is with the picture from the Ikea catalog that most of the world saw, but the picture without the mom with the dad and kids is the picture that was displayed in Saudi Arabia only. And there was the, the idea that the world was outraged because Ikea was erasing women. And what this demonstrates is this is a multinational that was trying to simultaneously adhere to local expectations and norms regarding EDI, but then is simultaneously being judged by global standards. And that demonstrates some of the challenges for multinationals in dealing with EDI. On the other hand, as a Canadian, I have to talk about the oil and gas industry and the uh, energy production firms, as they prefer to be called these days, uh, they have a, a different issue. For example, Chevron, Shell, BP, and ConocoPhillips, so these are some of the biggest names in the business, they all have perfect scores on the Human Rights um, Campaign Corporate Equality Index, indicating that, among other things, they, they do a lot of things to support their LGBTQ plus employees. However, they also operate in at least one of 40 or so countries 
countries where homosexual acts are remain illegal, for example, such as Uganda and Nigeria. So if these companies offered any sort of support to their LGBTQ plus employees in those countries, they could inadvertently out their employees and their employees could go to jail. So this demonstrates why EDI is so much more difficult in the international arena. So what we're trying to address then in this review is showing that relative to domestic firms, multinationals have an environment where it's both more challenging and more relevant to address systematic inequalities. More challenging because of the two examples I just shared with you, uh, where you're balancing local EDI expectations against global expectations, meaning that the normal international business decisions about localization versus standardization of practices involves a moral component that makes it very difficult to compromise. And on the other hand, more relevant because uh, your workforce uh, itself is also more diverse than domestic firms. You have all the same diversity that domestic firms exhibit, but in addition to that and layered on top of that, you also have higher levels of international and cross-cultural diversity. So it's even more complex than domestic firms to manage. And at the same time, multinationals have this power to disseminate HR practices. So we see this as, to some degree, a hopeful or good news story where multinational could be a catalyst for positive change to reduce inequality in the world. So the big question that we're trying to ask, answer with this review is, can existing international business research on EDI address the future demands for global equality and social justice? We, did, we approached this question then through a, a systematic process. We started by looking at what I'm going to be calling mainstream EDI research. That just means EDI research that's happening outside of international business. And we, look, we started there to establish the foundations that we were going to compare EDI research within IB against. Uh, then we did two different forms of review. We did a, a quantitative text analysis review, and then we did a more qualitative narrative analysis review. So I'm going to go through this process and at the end, end up with our recommendations for the future. So starting with where the field has gone in mainstream EDI research, it has evolved over time. And the you know, a good example of this is EDI research at the, the outset was often focused on equality. So this was the age of affirmative action and the, you know, equal, equal employment policies in firms. So, for example, Conrad and Linehan, that, that article is a good example of this era of of EDI research. But over time, and the example of the Cox and Blake article up on the screen here, the idea of uh, diversity management came into vogue. And this has been a predominant theme in EDI research for a long time, with the idea of the business case for diversity, managing diversity for firm performance. Um, but more recently, EDI research has gone back to its roots a little bit more, where these days, uh, ED, mainstream EDI research have, has a tendency to look again at equality or equity or social justice as the outcome that they're trying to achieve. And so when we were trying to summarize what's happening in mainstream EDI research, we use these two fundamental questions. And you'll see these coming up throughout my presentation. They structured our whole review. What is EDI and what is the purpose of EDI research? You can think of these as the what and the why. So for right now, when we when we looked at all of these reviews at the bottom of the screen, so these are current reviews. We want to know what's happening right now in mainstream EDI research. The current approach is that it's not about any sociodemographic differences. It's about those differences that have a historical, colonial, or power-based struggle for equality, um, such as the examples listed on, on the screen here. And as for the purpose, the why of we do EDI research, it has shifted over time, as I was mentioning, from this uh, performance-based argument to these days, we still see the performance-based argument, but we are additionally seeing the interventions that promote equality, where the goal is equality and social justice in organizations. It's summarized really well in an AMR introduction to a special issue that Stella wrote with a number of her colleagues in 2019. And the concluding sentence for this introduction to the special issue um, describes what's distinct or unique about the field of EDI research. They say, our distinctiveness can lie in being unapologetic about generating theory and research for 
attaining fairness, equality, and social justice, so that's the why, for marginalized social groups, and that's the who. So that answers both of those questions at the same time. So that's our summary and the foundation of mainstream EDI research that we wanted to now pivot to looking at EDI research within international business and compare what we're doing compared to what the mainstream is. So here's the two, the two types of reviews that we did. So we started with a text analysis, and this is where, where the purpose is looking for broad patterns and trends over time. We used, uh, we developed a database um, from the Business Source Complete data uh, source. And by the way, both of our data sets that we compiled and created for this review, I'm in the process of putting them up on a data repository. So they'll be available for anyone to use, review, critique, whatever it is you want to do with that. Uh, and that will be linked from the article. So you can access the data sets that we used. Then the zoomed in review that we followed it up with is looking just at EDI research within IB. And that one is where we where we dove deep into what exactly is being done in international business so we could understand the narratives, the stories, the purpose and theories. I'm going to start with the text analysis. OK, so this sample, we ended up with a sample of 1,622 articles. And we using those two search terms. Incidentally, we didn't use the term um, equity in, in this search because it produced way too many um, erroneous uh, results, specifically the field of finance, right? So we were looking for a data set that accurately represents the field. It doesn't have to be comprehensive, but it does have to be large in order to use Luke analysis. Um, LIWC is pronounced Luke, and this, this tool is good for looking at comparing the prevalence of a sets of terms between bodies of research or over time. So I'll show with you exactly how that works in a moment. The first thing we wanted to know is just the relative prevalence over time within IB and outside of IB. So what we found here is that it's not surprising that we would see less EDI research within IB than outside of IB, just because the field is smaller than the rest of business. But what is interesting and what, what, what is notable is the slope of the, of the lines. As you can see that there is a, a, a big push towards more EDI research and, and a lot more prevalence of EDI research in mainstream or outside of IB, especially in the 2000s and continuing in the 2010s. Um, but we're not seeing the same, the same push or the same increasing scale of research within IB. So we're estimating here that IB research may be lagging behind in part because we don't have the same um, pace of research in EDI within IB as what we're seeing outside of IB. Next, we wanted to know, well, who are we studying when it comes to EDI research in, in international business? So this, what you're seeing on the screen here, these are the, um, an example of a custom dictionary that we created and validated for use in Luke. Uh, what the process involves a, a series of steps that uh, involve both, you know, brainstorming lists of words and then validating that using international PhD students, using a team of international students who specialize in EDI. Um, and ultimately, we came up with these uh, with these dictionaries, they're called. And then Luke uses these terms to search for their relative prevalence across fields um, in the data set that we created. So what we ended up finding is this. Um, there's a couple things that are not too surprising. Is, for example, it's not surprising, and we would have expected that gender is by far and away the most studied category of research, both within IB and outside of IB. Um, it's also not surprising that international business research excels at studying diversity related to nationality and culture. This is what we would normally expect to see. We were somewhat surprised to see that um, IB ranked so high when it comes to race, uh, because it's not something that we generally see in IB research. And I suspect that some of that might be that Luke was picking up on terms such as ethnicity, which are, are, are more accurately representing things to do with race, but can be used in cross-cultural research as well. The other thing that we were surprised at is that international business research wasn't even more prevalent in topics like religious diversity and linguistic diversity, because we see these as areas where international business ought to really excel. 
So that could be one area for the future. But I think especially linguistic diversity, I'm seeing a lot more these days, and I hope to see more in IB research about religious diversity as well. So that was that first question in terms of what is EDI research. Then the second question about why or what is the purpose of EDI research, we turned to this categorization by Eli and Thomas in 2001. They developed the first three categories, of what we're calling diversity rationales, arguments for why organizations diversify. Uh, the performance argument is essentially diversifying because you want to, usually using the business case for diversity. Uh, the institutional argument is diversifying because you have to, usually adhering to rules and laws or to institutional pressures and norms. And then moral arguments for diversifying are diversifying because you ought to, because it's the right thing to do. And then we added a fourth, which has also been done by others before, which is the resistance against diversifying, because we wanted to capture the degree to which EDI research is currently examining some of the resistance against EDI or resistance against diversifying that we're seeing in popular media and in organizations. So we again went through this multi-step process of developing and validating our LUC uh, custom dictionaries. And the custom dictionaries, by the way, will also be available on JIBS through an online appendix. So if any of you are using LUC, you're free to download our dictionaries and use them in your own research. And what we ended up finding is that uh, there weren't actually very big differences between EDI research in international business in the gold and EDI research outside of international business in the black. There are some small differences. For example, EDI research in international business has a slight preference for using terminology related to performance-based arguments and slightly less comfortable using terminology related to moral arguments or the resistance against diversifying. Um, but I want to highlight two interesting findings from this from this uh, analysis. First of all, that we found that there was a significant overlap between the institutional and moral arguments for diversifying, meaning that the in one paper, it would often overlap between those two types of arguments. So in our, uh, or a paper that was examining legal analysis of EDI frameworks would often then also use moral arguments to justify it and vice versa. So what, So a few examples of this um, that highlight what you can do in EDI research, especially in international cross-national comparisons. Both of these papers were international comparisons of legal frameworks that used a combination of institutional and moral arguments to make, the, make their call about why this is important. The other interesting finding that we noted is we, by the way, we went in and we, we examined for those papers that were ranked very high on each of the different types of arguments, the top 10 for each argument within IB and outside of IB to examine what they're talking about, what types of arguments they're making. And the one thing that we noted is for those articles that were examining resistance against diversity, uh, the top 10 outside of international business, um, eight out of those top 10 were examining the resistance against immigrant employees, right? So this is obviously a hot topic when it comes to resist, uh, examining the resistance against diversity. It was almost entirely about resistance against immigrant diversity. Uh, within international business, it was only three out of the top 10 that were doing the same argument. Now, as you can see up on the screen here, this is a growing area of research, one I happen to be personally interested in as well. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for international business, given our own expertise in the global mobility of people, to weigh in on these debates about, the, about both immigrant diversity in general, and then also examining the resistance against it. I think that uh, Banu Uzkabet, Uzka Zanch Pan uh, said it really well in 2019, and she wrote that migration has become a lightning rod for conversations about the value of diversity and inclusion in liberal democracies. So I, uh, I like to follow her work. It's excellent. All right, so that's the that's the summary of what we or highlights from what we got from our text analysis. Now I'm going to turn to our narrative review. The purpose of this is to now dive deep into the research just happening within the international business area. So we're no longer comparing it 
against um, other research, but we are going to compare it against those foundations that we developed at the very beginning of what the, the, the idea is of EDI research outside of IB. We developed a sample of 101 papers. These are from the top nine journals classified as international business in the ABS journal list. Um, and we had an expanded search list here, although 75% of the articles that we found were, were found using the search term diversity. So you can already see the where the one of the trends is in, in EDI research in international business. We do focus a lot on diversity, less so on any of the others. And then as a team, we classified and commented on all of the, the factors or the themes at the bottom by research questions, rationales or arguments, theories they used, samples they, they drew on, what level of analysis, especially of the outcome or dependent variable, methods they were using and findings. And we used then this data set, which again is going to be available for everyone, uh, to draw some conclusions about answering those two fundamental questions. What is EDI research within international business? And what is the purpose of EDI research in international business? I'm going to skip right to our conclusions here. Um, in, and we ended up deciding that EDI research within international business examines any attribute that differentiates individuals. It particularly emphasizes cultural diversity. That was one of the strongly dominant themes that we noticed when it comes to diversity research in international business. Cultural diversity came out on top. Um, cultural or national diversity, those were often intertwined. And then that there was almost no mention of power differentials, historical, post-colonial, or power-based struggles for equality. The focus within international business research is what we're calling foundational theorizing that explains heterogeneity. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that in a moment. As for the purpose of EDI research, the purpose within international business is that it largely instrumentalizes EDI, meaning that we're using it to as a means to an end. And the end is usually either firm performance or something unique to the IB field, which is reducing internationalization process losses. That means that uh, diversity in many in much research in international business was used as a means to facilitate the internationalization process. And again, I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, so here's here's an example that will illustrate what I mean by both of those findings. Uh, I've pulled out a series of research questions that are quite common. So this illustrates the prevalence of cultural diversity as a topic for EDI research in international business, and also the prevalence of the performance outcome for EDI research. All of these research questions, and you can see that this varies over time, ranging from 1996 with Efrat Elrond, uh, her dissertation, all the way to 2022, um, a review article. So we can see that this, this topic continues to be prevalent in, for EDI research in international business over time. Um, and it illustrates what we really are talking about when we talk about EDI research. And actually, this, this part has been interesting to have Stella and Mustafa on the team, because as more mainstream EDI scholars, they looked at much of the research that we pulled for our data set in representing EDI in international business said, you know, this, this probably wouldn't even classify as EDI research in the mainstream um, because it doesn't address some of these power differentials or struggles for equality. Another example that illustrates the um, internationalization outcome variable that I said was unique to international business research. This is uh, research done by Angelique Breau. And she studied eight different French uh, firms that were all early in the stage of the internationalization process. And they, what she ended up finding, she used different terminology than the performance institutional resistance. I, I relabeled this because it maps pretty clearly onto the labels that we were using in this review. Um, but what she, what she ended up finding is that the diversity rationale that these firms were using as justification for diversifying influenced the way that they used diversity as a resource during the internationalization process and whether they were able to leverage diversity as a means to facilitate their internationalization process, largely using the performance-based diversity rationale, or whether their diversity actually became a hindrance, what she called a negative resource, um, using some sort of a resistance rationale. So that, and this is an excellent paper that I highly recommend. 
So in the last four slides here, I'm going to be reviewing our combined results from both sets of reviews and then using that to make our arguments for what we would like to see in the future, how we can improve the future EDI research in international business. And I'm going to separate that out. First, I'm going to do this for the first question, what is EDI research in international business? And then for the second question, what is the purpose or why do we do EDI research in international business? But overall of this, we we came to an answer to our original research question. And our, our general answer is that we conclude the approach to EDI research within international business is currently limiting the field's ability to address questions that are core to EDI research outside of international business. And I think the explanation will become clear as I give a few examples here. So what you see here is the original on the on the left hand side, the basis for comparison is what I've, I introduced at the very beginning, right? This is our basis for comparison using mainstream EDI research. So as a reminder, the mainstream EDI research, it focuses on those differences that involve some sort of struggle for equality. And what we ended up finding in international business research is that gender, same, same as it is mainstream, gender is by far and away the most common category in international business as well. But international business then follows that with national and cultural diversity. Um, and it's been slower on the uptake oh, over time. We, we we're estimating here this may be about a decade behind and just in terms of activity of research in this field um, compared to the mainstream. And then the, our narrative analysis findings, we found that there was almost no mention of power differentials, historical, post-colonial, or power-based struggles for equality, especially in some of the top journals. So this is something that was distinctly lacking in EDI research in international business. Instead, the focus is on what I call foundational theorizing, explain, focusing on heterogeneity. An example of this, and I think this is an excellent paper that I, that I highly endorse, uh, but it, it, it demonstrates what I mean by foundational theorizing. Uh, this paper is a theoretical paper that draws on multiple fields, including political science and law, and they, it explains how cultural boundaries and national boundaries interact at multiple levels. So they look within countries, between countries, and then also pan countries. Uh, and it's, it's strong theorizing, it explains how heterogeneity interacts across levels and between groups. Um, but it doesn't tend to address the things that are core to EDI re research, which is these power-based struggles for equality. So this exemplifies what we do well and maybe what we are currently missing. As a result, what we would like to see in the future is we would like to see uh, much more emphasis on power dynamics when we're examining EDI research. So a sample research question that we would like to see is how can EDI be managed in multinationals without reproducing the home country's power to define what differences matter? And as well, we would like to see um, more fluidity and when it comes to our definitions of diversity. And I say this because I know I'm guilty of doing the same, of measuring diversity in a way that's very binary and very static, and that's not really that's not reality. Uh, so an example research question here is, how do mobile su subjectivities impact decisions about localizing versus globally integrating EDI? And this is a particular challenge in the, in the IB arena. So that was the first question, what is EDI research? The second question about purpose, the why, why do we do it? Uh, reminder from the mainstream EDI research, um, does it these days, the, the current EDI research, does it to promote social justice and equality, right? That tends to be the focus of a lot of current EDI research, especially the, the really core mainstream EDI research. Um, what, our, what we found in terms of EDI research within IB is that um, the dominant rationale tends to be performance gains from EDI or reducing internationalization process losses, facilitating the internationalization process. But this was still a performance-based argument was clearly still prevalent within EDI research and international business. Um, we found that moral arguments were commonly intertwined with institutional arguments and that when, when we did see some moral arguments, this is when you are more likely to see some examination of power differentials or power dynamics in research in international business. And so 
what we would like to see in the future is that we would like to see, we've, we've set, listed it here as de-emphasizing the performance arguments. We still want to see the performance argument or the business case for diversity. It continues to be interesting. It continues to be important. We, we want to in, encourage researchers to also go beyond that, right? So there's an influential paper by Eli and Thomas um, called Beyond the Business Case in 2020, where they also say, you know, it's time to move beyond that. Even if it doesn't incur performance benefits to treat people fairly and have equal outcomes, it's still the right thing to do. And so this is where we see the moral arguments in particular as being useful as a way to move beyond the business case for diversity. Um, some examples of research questions that we would like to see in the future are how do employees fr from underrepresented groups respond when firms are clearly acting upon the performance arguments for EDI? And there might be international or cross-cultural differences there and how employees respond to that. As well, under what conditions do multinationals exacerbate inequalities? So this, this is a question that's coming more from the critical diversity studies approach. And finally, we would like to see more examination of the resistance to EDI. This is something that's happening in uh, popular media, and it's something that's happening in our organizations around the world. And we, we as international business scholars, are well-placed to examine this and understand what's causing it. So, for example, how have multinationals reduced resistance to immigrant employees? Thanks so much to all of you for sitting through all of that and stay tuned for the final paper, uh, which hopefully will be coming out soon. If you want a copy earlier than that, feel free to email me and I'm happy to send it to you. And now I think we can open it up to Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Stacy. We have uh, the webinar chat open as well as the Q&A box uh, open. And in the, uh, in the meantime, while we uh, receive any specific questions, I was uh, starting to um, uh, type up uh, a specific uh, idea that came to my mind, uh, because as you're probably aware, here in the United States, especially in the practitioner literature, another uh, initial has been added to the EDI acronym, the B, um, about uh, belongingness. And um, of course, this is something that we, you know, as uh, researchers uh, uh, tend to uh, uh, need a little bit of time to see exactly what uh, practitioners mean by that. Uh, but um, my first question to this uh, uh, presentation that uh, uh, I appreciate very much, uh, you and uh, uh, Stella and Mustafa's uh, um, sharing with us, is uh, how about belonging? <laughs> uh, did you see anything? Do you think this is uh, an area that needs to be added to the uh, discussion? I mean, what are your thoughts? And of course, um, more than happy to hear not just your thoughts, uh, Stacy, but also Stella's or Mustafa's. Okay, I'll, I'll start, uh, Miguel, on that one. That's a good question because this is a very recent uh, development where you, if you were reading that companies want belonging, right? you know, ours was a review. And, and so we would not have picked that up in our review. But what's interesting to me about this new discourse on belonging, if you look closely at the literature on inclusion, belonging is part of the dimensions of being included. So again, it's one of these things that we're adding on terminology. And in a sense, inclusion encompasses the idea of belonging. And so one of the things that's interesting about, I think our study now, Mustafa and Stacy, when I think about it, and, and maybe, maybe that should be in the uh, whole uh, idea of future research, we didn't find a lot of IB research that really focused on inclusion. No, so it's the very, IB, very few. Yeah, so that was sort of a, 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 a blank space. So I think that even points to the, the fact that for people in the IB field, there's opportunity to even, in a sense, catch up a little bit by looking more at what does inclusion mean in an M&E context. How do you how do you how do you how do you come to the idea that um, you have employees from diverse backgrounds, mobile identities? How do you figure out how 
you can create an organization that includes everyone and to the extent that they feel like they fully belong, you know, versus holding on maybe to their national identity or whatever identity they may have. So I, I think that is that is a interesting area for future research for those out there uh, listening to this conversation. But I'd like to hear what Mustafa thinks about that, belonging. Sure. Oh, yes. Belonging um, was part of my PhD. I looked at belonging and otherness in the financial services sector and of last century, that old <laughs> now. Um, and in that, what I did uh, was a bit of a linguistic game. Belonging has two parts, being, which is about authenticity, being able to be yourself at work. The other one is more interesting, is about longing, longing to be. So it's about a commitment to change, changing organizations so that you can be. Um, uh, so I was always uh, using and teaching these um, word games, um, uh, approaching belonging by dissecting it into these two essential elements. Uh, authenticity is a huge part of, uh, I think, belonging. Organizations are crafted by people who um, um, do not really represent the current cohorts uh, that are going in. And um, uh, atypical people, newcomers, find it difficult to remain authentic. And authenticity is a privilege at the moment. And um, our longing is done to craft, recraft institutions to make it possible for uh, people who come from different backgrounds to, uh, to be uh, as themselves. Um, but we haven't included, uh, I agree with Stella, we should, um, but it's a good opportunity, this uh, webinar, to do that. So those of you who are listening can take the <laughs> lightning road. Absolutely. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you very much, Stella. In fact, uh, you, there was an interesting comment in the webinar chat uh, from Sarita Thomas, I believe. I hope I'm not uh, buttering your first name or last name. Uh, she says, or he says, I'm sorry, again, <laughs> along the same lines, there are some including justice, which is really an extension of equity, which, uh, you know, that makes a, a lot of sense. And by the way, we are starting to see uh, questions within the Q&A window. So let me read the next one so that uh, Stacy, Stella, or Mustafa can um, tell us uh, their uh, thoughts on uh, these uh, couple of uh, questions from uh, Jayin Kin. Um, uh, the, first of all, uh, the comment begins with, thank you, Stacy, for the insightful presentation. I have two questions. Number one, regarding quantitative uh, text analysis, does it take into account the approach to studying diversity? For instance, you mentioned that gender diversity is extreme, extensively studied, but does the analysis capture how this co categorization is approached, considering that many IB studies treat gender as a control variable <laughs> control variable. Uh, there seems to be a, a word perhaps or an idea missing yeah. at the end. Uh, then the second question is when it comes to the, re to the review methodology, do you believe that conducting a narrative analysis across both IB and non-IB journals would yield a more accurate comparative analysis of how EDI is studied? And of course, she uh, mentions or, or he mentions, thank you again for an enlightening presentation. So please. Um, I'm happy to take number one, and maybe Stella and Mustafa, you can take number two. Yeah. Um, so for, for number one, as for uh, assessing the methodologies, our, our Luke analysis didn't capture that, but we know just from reading so much of the research in IB and outside of IB that in general, IB takes a far more quantitative approach to studying EDI research than mainstream EDI research, which is largely qualitative. Um, and so that's partly why uh, in IB, as you mentioned, right, this uh, previous review of gender in IB found that it's often used as control variable. It's often very binary in the way that IB captures diversity categories. And uh, Stella and Mustafa, do you want to comment about the comparing using a narrative review, comparing and contrasting? Okay. Um, with narrative analysis, this was um, the part we had the most critical review feedback because IB field uh, is not um, very accustomed to narrative analysis. It kind of symbolically denigrates it in a way, but it's not the same in other fields. Uh, narrative analysis is considered a helpful means by which 
critical uh, review of literature could be conducted. Um, there is actually literature uh, by um, Trish uh, Greenhawk showing the spurious hierarchy created in some disciplines that uh, denigrate uh, narrative analysis. So we've taken their advice and we have used critical um, perspective that narrative analysis provides. So um, in this case, it really was very helpful and we have it has taken us a long time, <laughs> trust me, to <laughs> get the reviewers on our side in this case, but it is treated in a different way in other disciplines. Mm. Yeah, I don't think we would have found anything different because the question says comparing IB journals versus non-IB journals. Uh, because we're trying to see how did IB, how did the IB specifically look at it? So I, I don't think that we would have uh, gotten anything different. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't the unit think of analysis is uh, the journal publication itself, not so much the journal in which uh, it appears, I, I would think, I would guess also. Yeah. Very good. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we uh, could go to the next uh, question, it's uh, that uh, it's from uh, Puria Jafari. Um, the comment says, uh, thank you, Stacy, for your insightful presentation. Would you kindly share if you have any specific plans for future research in different regions with different cultures, since EDI research is mostly based on cultural factors? I suspect it's a question on uh, um, regions uh, of the world. I don't know if... Uh, that's uh, an interpretation that I'm getting, but uh, somebody might have a different <laughs> way to understand this question. I, I might throw this one to Mustafa because uh, I, I don't know anybody who is more prolific when it comes to EDI research. So I'm sure mm -hmm. you have projects in process in multiple regions in the world. Yes, I think EDI research is um, very rich in terms of its regional focus because um, uh, context gives a uh, meaning to diversity. Uh, different categories of diversity um, do not easily migrate. I have been doing research in different regions of the world, and today I got a paper accepted in Central and Eastern Europe with um, Andreas, who is here <laughs> also uh, participating in the uh, paper looking at the oil and gas industry. I was so pleased that Stacy. Uh, actually raised that industry. Um, and uh, actually, uh, not only sectors, um, uh, not only regions, but also industries are very important domains of exploration because industries have their different logics that give uh, different uh, emphasis to different categories of diversity. Mm. If you look at, for example, oil, oil and um, energy sector, it's a very different set of priorities to, in comparison to cr uh, cultural industry versus um, 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 manufacturing industry that produces furniture. Mm. What I would say to Puraya, I think that's really worthy because one of the one of the points that we make is the meaning of EDI or the meaning of what is what is diversity will differ according to region or even country. So, you know, I think that that is a fruitful area for research and there's lots of opportunities to do that because most EDI was originally based on categories prevalent in the USA. And so I would say, yes, we should do more of that work. And you say, for example, you say in the question, EDI is mostly based on a cultural factor. Well, it's not always the cultural factor. It depends on where you are in the world. So, so I think, yes, we need much more around that. And I think especially in the M&E space, where uh, M&E by itself implies multicultural workplaces. So you're going to have a, a workplace with lots of different cultures. So how do you begin to understand the meaning of EDI within a workplace like that? So I would just say to everyone, there is a lot of frontier research that could be done in relationship to the question that you raised. And I see too, if I may, there's a related question uh, from Frank Horowitz in the chat, which is an intriguing question. Uh, and maybe Mustafa, you'll have to jump in. How do you achieve belonging 
if people are working in hybrid and virtual forms like we are. Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's so, some literature from uh, previous uh, decades looking at um, uh, imagined belongings and imagined solidarities by industrial mm -hmm. relations scholars. So we need to look further afield because industrial relations scholars have looked at how people sh uh, show solidarity and how that is assumed. We can uh, uh, not always physical form, but it across people can show solidarity. So we need to identify solidarity and belonging concepts can be also brought together. We can look at new virtual forms of belonging. I think these are all great um, research venues, um, Stella. Frank, uh, yeah. why don't you start researching this? I mean, you're, you're already in that field anyway. <laughs> well, you know, I think I want to I want to throw something in there real quick about that virtual space that it's I read this. I think it's a research at Harvard Business School. You know, in terms of uh, marginalized groups, especially I think her study was on people in the U.S. workspace, uh, African-Americans, where many of them were happy to work from home and not to go to work because that allowed them to avoid the microaggressions that they typically face in their workplaces. So they actually liked working in a virtual space. That's a very interesting area of exploration. Mm -hmm. So I think it does complicate the question of inclusion and belonging. And Sorry. specifically in the international arena, linguistic diversity in general. So these days, there seems to be a general consensus that hybrid and virtual work where so much is text based can be an advantage for people who are working in a non native language. And further to that, there are inequalities in terms of access. I mean, we assume that everybody has perfect access to virtual environments, mm. and there is um, uh, inequalities in income. Uh, are directly translated to digital inequalities. So we need to be wary of using these technologies and assuming that everybody will have the same access. Absolutely. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Um, well, we still have um, a couple or three more questions uh, that uh, we uh, might want to eventually take a look at. But uh, if you don't mind, let me just uh, uh, share with uh, our audience uh, a few uh, um, announcements. Uh, first of all, we have the next installment of our IHRN webinar series with a presentation on how art, particularly paintings, may be used in, in international HR management uh, research and or teaching. And Jaime Bonache, who I think uh, is uh, with us uh, around here from Universidad Carlos III de Madrid, will be our presenter in September. Details will be provided in a few weeks. If you have signed up, if you're with us, you have signed up for the webinar series. Therefore, you will be receiving a reminder in a few uh, weeks, okay? Uh, uh, also, if you have any suggestions on topics or speakers for the coming year, please send them to me or to any of my fellow organizers, Mila uh, Lazarova, Elaine Farndale, Maral Murekbekova, I'm sorry about that, Marion Festing or Maya Vidovic. Uh, we are looking forward to the next season of this IHRM series in the second half of 2023. Uh, also, there are uh, calls for papers uh, that uh, uh, Elaine uh, Farndale is uh, uh, probably going to post with us for us uh, um, in a few uh, uh, moments. Uh, in fact, again, if you are uh, part of the Center for International HR Series uh, mailing list, you have received them very recently, uh, probably today. <laughs> uh, and please visit, subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel where we have been posting the recordings for each of the webinars for the benefit of our discipline, of our students, and of our colleagues, uh, anyone who has been unable to join us uh, in this uh, uh, webinar series. Uh, um, well, uh, like I said, we still have a, a couple of minutes perhaps, uh, and I see in the webinar chat, uh, Elaine's uh, links to the calls for papers uh, and to the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, but um, if um, uh, Stacy, Stella, or Mustafa would like to uh, tell us uh, any, either closing comments or address any of the questions on the Q&A, uh, that would be wonderful. Can I just the question by Dana Sumter, uh, where she asked, 
as scholars of the, at the intersection of EDI and IB, how do you personally, as scholars and human beings, grapple with the study of nations which have values or laws which are inherently exclusive or even dehumanizing to some groups? Uh, you know, I'd like to bring that back to the research. I think that is a great research study to see how companies are grappling with that. So, for example, uh, Stacy mentioned Uganda. I mean, we are, you know, people can be executed for their sexual identity. So what will companies do? Will you go to do business in Uganda? Uh, you know, like me personally, I probably would say I would speak out about it, but I think the bigger question is what are organizations going to do? And that's part of one of the issues that came up in our study. This Thank you. is an excellent question, actually. Um, at many levels, um, I think mm. our emphasis is generally more confessional. When we are looking at um, EDI practices, we are looking at um, uh, mainly overt practices and never uh, subtle and covert forms of support for um, mm. LGBT communities. We have studied this in another paper recently because in a dangerous context, what role HR can play or international business can play uh, to uh, mitigate the danger and risk. Um, I think uh, there is a real absolute need for this kind of research. And some organizations we found do take um, uh, some um, subtle forms of support without outing their uh, employees. So, um, it, it, but it's a great venue, uh, Donna, maybe again for you to <laughs> first. <laughs> The, the other approach that I find helps um, is, is taking a more historical perspective. So I'm also part of the GLOBE project, measuring cultures around the world. And in that project, it's been nice to take a historical perspective about how cultures are changing. And one of the dimensions that we measure, of course, is gender egalitarianism. And we can see that even for those countries that are on the low end of the spectrum in terms of gender egalitarianism, that they are also changing over time and largely, not all, but largely improving. So that can help, I find. Not that, they're, not that the pendulum cannot swing on the other side, like uh, recent years have shown us, right? Unfortunately, so we cannot uh, be too complacent or too optimistic, too rosy, but uh, I don't want to finish this uh, uh, webinar with a, a dark note. Rather, I'd like to thank you, Stacy. Thank you so much, Stella. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, you have uh, uh, given us a, a lot to think about, uh, which is exactly what uh, we're looking forward to in this uh, um, uh, webinar series. Um, I'm, I apologize to uh, those uh, colleagues who have uh, sent uh, questions and we have not been able to address, but uh, we have uh, we will receive them and share them with our speakers to the extent that uh, uh, it is possible they might uh, be able to also uh, send uh, answers. Uh, no promises done, just uh, uh, just uh, promise that we'll we will uh, share those thoughts uh, with our uh, presenters for the future. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Looking forward to seeing you in September in uh, our IHRM webinar series number 26. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.